This is Lester Smith reporting. Next news as it happens. Next scheduled news at 11 o'clock over WOR Radio 710, the talk of New York. And now, let's join Gene Shepard. Tonight's signal is uh, jamming by jealous stations. All right, uh, it's time once again to give a salute to contemporary culture. Onward we are climbing every day a higher one. We are aiming at the top of the pyramid of life. Never upward and onward we are moving, moving steadily. Yes, sir, we are really honored, honored. Yes, sir, we are really moving now. Ba ba da ba ba da ba 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 ba. Oh, thank God I am a 20th century man. Oh, thank God I wasn't born a squirrel or a turtle. I am born. <laughs> yeah, I always want them. Uh, you, you always got to leave them wanting more. Hello, Tess. Wait, I've got to fix this thing up here. It's just giving me more trouble here. Hey, hello, Tess. Hello there. Yeah. Let me here. I'll plug this plug in. There, I'll plug this in now. 
Got everything adjusted here. Ha da 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 I don't know where that home is coming from. It's all right. It's not your fault, Lee. It's okay. You didn't invent 126 cycles. It's okay. <laughs> all right for the U.S. of A. Oh, uh, the reason that I uh, picked uh, tonight, after all, it's the beginning of the week. And uh, you can always be serious at the beginning of a week, can't you? Of course. It's, uh, as, the, as the week gets on and things get sillier and sillier and, uh, you know, events pile up during the week, you can then uh, give in to your Harpo Marx tendency and start blowing horns and flapping your lips and yelling and hitting guys with the pig bladders and stuff like that. You know, it's just in a t- <laughs> well, sure you can. And uh, this is an old, uh, an old axiom in the comedy. You can start out low key, see. And by the end, you know, you're squirting the audience with seltzer water. And uh, you leave in a cloud of confetti and uh, accriminations. Before we go any further, accriminations? What's that? You don't like that, huh? Well, James Joyce got famous inventing words. How, you know, what's the matter with me there? However, uh, getting back to uh, what I was about to say, uh you know, there's a, there's a current, always there's a belief, I guess it goes all the time with man, and that is that he's living in times that are finally enlightened. Uh, you know, that, that man has, fun. yeah, oh yeah, it was a common belief that, that at any time, uh, the people of the past were abysmally ignorant. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of chuckle about them, the dumb things they knew uh, and thought, and, uh, but we've arrived at the age of enlightenment. In fact, they even, uh, you know, there are some guys that believe this so much. Did you know that, uh, that I heard recently on an interview, this guy says, well, of course, uh, we are living in the age of total awareness. What a crock of banana oil that is. <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's like the sublime, uh, so, and of course he was implying that he was one of the leaders of the awareness crowd, totally aware of the world. And uh, somebody, somebody sent me uh, a textbook. Now you know, yes, uh, I, I, uh, I, from time to time, when I go down to old bookstores, like um, down on Fourth Avenue, you sell these old books and used books and stuff. You can buy old textbooks. Now most people don't buy old textbooks; they buy uh, other things, uh, you know, like old copies of Hemingway. But I buy old textbooks, and I have, uh, for example, I have an 1872. No, an 1868 geography book. And that's a fantastic textbook. Now, I'm going to, now hold on a minute. For all of you who believe that your textbooks are dispensing truth, I would like to read right now here, I have an 1850 textbook. This is the real thing. This is not a reprint. It's a, it's an 1850 textbook called A Guide to the Scientific Knowledge of Things Familiar. Hey, that's a great, uh, that's a great, uh, Title and it's by the Reverend Dr. Brewer of Trinity Hall, Cambridge. Now that's about as official a university you can get. Cambridge, right? And of course, back in this period in 1850, uh, the the uh, the reverends of the period occupy the same place that in today's life doctors occupy. You know, an M.D. today used to be scientist, you know, but a doctor today occupies a very special place. So. Uh, if a doctor is asked about sex, now he may be a eunuch himself. He may know nothing at all about sex, but he's considered a very, he's an expert on it. He's a doctor. Doctors are experts on politics. This is called the Dr. Spock syndrome. Uh, a doctor is an expert on universal things in our time. Now, uh, in, in 1850, it was the reverend. The reverend was the universal expert on uh, anything. So he, uh, he, this is the Reverend Dr. Brewer of Trinity Hall, Cambridge. Now, that's very official. And uh, I, I read the uh, title of the book here even further. It says, uh, he is the Lord Master of King's College School, Norwich. Now, that's pretty official. He's the uh, Lord Master. And uh, there's a lot of uh, Latin quotations. Whenever you want to really give the people what they want, preface what you're about to say with a Latin quotation. And there's no argument about that. Now, the book uh, was published in New York in 1850 by James Miller uh, of uh, 647 Broadway. I wonder what's at 647 Broadway now. A little place where they sell used buttons, probably. 
But uh, nevertheless, in those days, it was a really top uh, flight publishing house. They published books, you know, that came out under the Cambridge University imprint. Now, here are some of the the uh, statements he makes. And uh, he does not say, it is my opinion. This is uh, stated as fact, just as so many things in your textbooks are stated as fact. <laughs> All right, here, for example, question. This book, by the way, is in the question and answer form. All the way through, it's questions and answers. The scientific answer and the question about it. For example, today you would say, what is an IC? Or what is a transistor? Well, he would then answer. All right, here's what the question is. Why does lightning turn milk sour? This, incidentally, is under the general heading of the electrical phenomena. Now, you smile, see? Look at that smile. Now, I might also add, <laughs> no, we smile at the at the naive ignorance of the past, and yet there are many people listening right now who believe seriously that lightning does uh, cause milk to sour, and they also believe in Gene Dixon and astrology. So uh, let's not... <laughs> <laughs> let's not uh, let's not smile at the uh, at the uh, you know the the confusion of the past. You want to hear his answer to that? All right. Why does lightning turn milk sour? There's no question that it does. You see, he knows it's it's a positive question. He answers: Lightning causes the gases of the air through which it passes to combine, and thus produces a poison called nitric acid some small portion of which mixes with the milk and thus turns it sour. Well, now that, that sounds very, very scientific. See, I mean, nitric acid, but, well, actually, uh, <laughs> now there's, there's argument going on in there. All right, you want to hear some more. Okay. Uh, I'll give you uh, some other questions that uh, might, um, okay. All right. Um, Okay, does oxygen and nitrogen combine, uh, if only mixed together, in common atmospheric air? Quote, they only mix together, as grains of sand would do, when shaken in a bottle. The oxygen and nitrogen combine. They do not constitute air, but acid poisons. Oh, here's a good one for you. Now, now, now this may have not uh, occurred to you. Question, why does lightning turn beer sour? although it is contained in a closed cask. Because if beer be new and the process of fermentation incomplete, lightning will so accelerate the process as to turn the sugar into acetic acid at once without passing through the intermediate state of alcohol. Now remember, this man is a scientist of his day. He's not just a, a reverend. He's a scientist, you know. You must understand uh, why is not old beer and strong porter made sour by lightning? Well, it's obvious because the fermentation is more complete and therefore is less affected by electrical influence. Uh, <laughs> why does lightning purify the air? Well, now, you know what, what this question is based on. That's based on the idea that when lightning does pass, uh, is discharged. It doesn't really pass through the air. It's discharged. When lightning d is discharged, there is a byproduct of this called ozone, O3, right? Okay. And you smell this, and this is a, it's purify the air, see? But here's what his, he says. He says, why does lightning purify the air? For two reasons. First, because the electric fluid, remember, they considered electricity in those days an actual fluid. It was considered like, uh, like we consider water, a, 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 an element that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an entity. Electricity was called a fluid in those days. It was just like, uh, you know, like, uh, stones and so on. Electricity was always in something. But to bring it out, it took certain things, you see, to, to happen. Anyway, uh, why does lightning purify the air? Well, for two reasons. First, because the electric fluid produces nitric acid in its passage through the air. Okay. Uh, second, because the agitation of the storm stirs up the air. That's why it... Uh, yes, this is WOR New York. Okay. Now, do you want to hear another one? Uh, <laughs> how does the production uh, of nitric acid purify... Well, now, you don't want to get in... You want to get in some other things here now. You've, you've heard this, uh, uh, you know, about electricity... Now here, uh, 
we can go to, um, uh, let's see, how about, uh, how about friction now? Would you like to know what he says about friction? Okay. What is meant by friction? Well, it's the act of rubbing two things together. Well, that's pretty logical. That's very, very right on. As now, here's where he gets interesting. Only in the in the fifties, eighteen fifties, would he give this kind of an illustration. Uh, answer is the act of rubbing two things together, as the Indians rub two pieces of wood together to produce a fire. He didn't. You know, the Indians were around in eighteen fifty. In fact, this was some twenty five years before Mister. Uh, uh, or General Custer's debacle. Uh, well, it was about 30 years before he really got it. Uh, he says, uh, how do the Indians produce fire by merely rubbing two pieces of dry wood together? Well, they take a piece of dry wood sharpened to a point, which they rub quickly up and down a flat piece until a groove is made, and the dust collected in this groove catches fire. Well, why does the wood catch fire? It's a good question. He says, well, because... Latent heat is developed from the wood by friction. Now we're getting there. He says the best woods for this purpose are boxwood. So try that. I didn't know that, but the boxwood works better than any other kind of wood. He says, uh, uh, do not carriage wheels sometimes catch fire? I didn't know that. That would be a great bit in a John Wayne movie, the carriage wheels catching fire. He says, yes, quite frequently. When the wheels are dry or fit too tightly or revolve very rapidly. Well, that would be a beautiful bit in a Western, you know, his wheels catch fire. See, uh, he says, why do the wheels catch fire in such cases? Well, because the axle tree disturbs the latent heat and produces ignition. Now, I have a reason for telling you all this because you see, remember, we're not, I'm not making fun of the past because this is, you know, this was the knowledge of the day and these were intelligent people. And, uh, you know, and then all the way on through, you can just read practically every question here is uh, is got, got uh, you know curious misinformation involved in it. But uh, was it right, or is or or have we replaced a lot of this with other misinformation? <laughs> now that's a good question. See, uh, we don't want to you know bring that up because that could be because he's got some great stuff in here about uh, decaying vegetables. See. Uh, because he believes that the decaying of a vegetable, he says, why does a vegetable decay? Decay. He says, because time produ- time releases the noxious gases that are contained by all vegetables. They didn't understand the, uh, what we call, it, you know, the, the decaying process and so on. It, they, they believed that it was a noxious gas that was in every peach, for example, and that if you left it sit a while, the noxious gas would start coming out and therefore produce decay. So, uh, you know, little things like that, you go right, right down the line. Uh, there's a great, there's a great piece in here, uh, on teeth, for example. Uh, what causes the decay of teeth? Hmm. Well, there are certain materials in foods, he says. Uh, the, the dentine is full of little tubes filled with lime. And, uh, there are certain things in the, in foods, certain noxious gases, which react with the lime and form various acids. You see, so, well, he may be just, just about, why does creosote cure toothache? Well, creosote acts as a caustic and burns away the mortified bone. We, or ulcer upon it, which produce the pain. And when the mortified bone is gone, the pain will go. So, uh, you know, you could sit here by the hour. Incidentally, they have a, a, a little plug here in the back in 1850. It says, don't forget the children. There are many great children's books which we publish, including Little Rudy and Other Tales by Hans Christian Andersen, who at that time was a contemporary dynamic writer. The Mud King's Daughter and Other Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, which was a, it's a new edition. So, uh, you know, things, <laughs> not much has changed since 1850. Uh, there's always a commercial, by the way, there's a commercial at the end of the book, so in 1850 they believed in commercials too, which reminds me. Uh, <laughs> you want to hear another question. For example, here's from that 1850 textbook, and uh, I'm going to uh, read a question to you and see if you can answer this. Now, uh, now listen carefully. Uh, can you answer this, Lee? 
Uh, this is a question uh, in the physiology department. Uh, we all have a yeah. We all we all have a physical body, and uh, you should know something about it. Okay, what is the cause of animal heat? The heat in the human body. Did you say vodka? Oh, girls. Well, no, that's your animal heat. But what causes her? Oh, you. I see. Ah, I see. I understand. All right. But the, what does cause you to be at the, the, the bodily temperature? What is your temperature? Night. What is it? What is the official temperature? 103.7? 96.4? Or 94.6? Or 98.4? Or 98.6? Or 96.8? Which is it? 98.6. Well, why are you at 98.6 when, let's say, the temperature around you is at 40 degrees, or we'll say 115. Where does that temperature come from? Well, here's the answer. You don't know? <laughs> In other words, you, you, you better not laugh at these guys. You're just as... All right, the answer is animal heat is produced by the combustion of hydrogen and carbon in the capillaries of the vessels, the capillary vessels. That means, then, that there's a little fire in there going on. There's a fire going on in you. There's this little fire, and it's combustion going. And uh, he, he, <laughs> so the next question goes on there. It says, uh, well, uh, if animal heat is produced by combustion, well, why does not the human body burn up? That's a good question if you accept the idea that there's like coal or, uh, or a candle. Answer, it actually does so. Every muscle, nerve, and organ of the body actually wastes away like a burning candle and, being reduced to air and ashes, is rejected from the system as useless. This is getting interesting. Question then, if every bone, muscle, nerve, and organ is thus consumed by combustion, why is not the body entirely consumed? Aha! He says. Answer. It would be so, unless the parts destroyed were perpetually renewed. But as a lamp will not go out so long as it is supplied with fresh oil, neither will the body be consumed as long as it's supplied with fresh food. Huh. Fascinating. All right. So this is from an 1850 textbook. Now, you want to know about present-day uh, ignorance? Okay. Now, this is why I brought this up. Uh here is a piece from the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin of a couple of weeks ago. This is Philly. And uh, this is not, uh, you know, some uh, some uh, backwater in the nation or anything like that. And uh, the headline is, Prospective Jurors Ignorant of Meaning of Nazism. Now listen to this piece. You won't believe it, but it's actually true. In Milwaukee, now Milwaukee's a big town, right? It's not, uh, you know, it's not Rabbit Hash, Kentucky or anything like that. Milwaukee. Some months ago, two members of the Milwaukee chapter of the Nazi Party, uh, parentheses, the National Socialist White People's Party, smashed the windows of an auto while the owner, a Jewish person, sat inside. They were arrested and a short while ago went on trial. Everyone concerned with the trial thought that choosing a jury of 12 men and women who were not disgusted by the very term Nazi would be very difficult. In other words, you'd be predisposed to be against a guy who says he's a Nazi just because, you know, the word, see. Uh, so the lawyer for the two Nazis felt that it would be almost impossible to find a jury that was not prejudiced by the word itself. Quote, I'm quoting him here, I thought people would associate the word Nazis with concentration camps and the killing of Jews, O'Neill said. I was very shocked. He says, I was more than surprised. I was shocked. Uh, and remember, this is the defense attorney. Say, O'Neill, his name is, was shocked because after questioning 23 randomly selected average citizens, all middle-aged and all alive during World War II, this is what he found. Virtually none of the prospective jurors knew anything at all about Nazism. Two, they did not associate Nazism with World War II. Now, I don't make the news, friends. I'm just merely quoting what he found. They did not associate Nazism with Adolf Hitler. Okay? 
they did not associate Nazism with racial hatred or concentration camps or even the killing of six million Jews. Uh, so then they tried to find out, well, what did they associate it with? You know, they, you know, so they went back and they asked him. See, one of the reporters uh, on hand for the Milwaukee Journal, a big paper, by the way, so when he heard this, he went back and asked these people. Well, one woman said, uh, we quote here, oh, yes, uh, well, Nazism is a dictatorship, but I really can't say any more about it. I don't know. It's just some kind of a dictatorship. Okay, that was her answer. Uh, another woman asked, uh, what it was, what a Nazi said, well, I know, Nazism means, uh, Nazi means communist. <laughs> I like that. Listen to this one. Uh, there was a guy that was asked, he said, well, uh, yeah, I, I heard of Nazis, but I don't listen to the news that much. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah, all right. I don't listen to the news that much, which was kind of a great line. And, uh, O'Neill, that's the defense attorney and the judge, Patrick Madden, were stunned. The judge says, all 23, he says, it, word Nazi just doesn't mean anything to any of them. They don't know what, at all what it means. And uh, they discovered that the word Nazi and Nazism is virtually unknown to them. Oddly enough, and here's the odd thing, a Nazi had just run in a primary election for mayor of Milwaukee. <laughs> In other words, the word Nazi was in the in the paper, see? The newspapers were full of stories about him. He lost the primary, but he got nearly 5,000 votes. Oh, ho. The man who brought the charges against the two Nazis was not at all surprised that the jury knew nothing about him. Uh, he said, because uh, they've, they've already found that a lot of the people uh, just don't know. And he says, uh, I consider, the, the judge says, I consider the uh, ignorance about Nazism to be very serious. He says, it's frightening, those replies, very frightening. He says, I don't know who said it, but if you don't know history, you are doomed to repeat it. Now, if you think this is an exaggeration, let me tell you something now. I, I, there was a great line by George Ade, who, uh, in fact, wrote uh, as a moral to one of his fables back in 1895. He says, it is impossible to over estimate the ignorance of the average man. <laughs> now, that sounds like you're putting people down, but it happens to be actually true. I don't think mo most people know much about uh, just what, you know, what's going on. Uh, they don't, they, they have a general knowledge that they're alive. In fact, recently, do you know that they took a, uh, a, na a nation, a, a national selected cross-section poll of, of kids in high school and they discovered uh, now these are high school students uh, you know going to good high schools and bad high schools and just high schools and by far the overwhelming majority of them given a list of 15 presidents could not recognize that these people had been president so if you ask a kid uh, what was Calvin Coolidge you'd like to say to you oh wasn't he uh wasn't he some kind of a distant runner in the past? Some guy that won the Olympics or something in the old days? <laughs> and who was, yeah, wasn't he a pole vaulter? They had all kinds of crazy, uh, and these kids weren't being funny. Uh, that, 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 uh, one of them, for example, uh, thought that Dwight Eisenhower, and, uh, one of them, this was a whole, you know, among many other completely confusing remarks, that, uh, that Dwight Eisenhower was in the Civil War. And, uh, the idea that he had been president just never occurred to uh, any of them. At the, so it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, now I remember, now I, at first I thought, you know, if you're in, if you're in media, you learn a lot of this stuff probably much quicker than people who are in education, you know, where you, to, you, you hand something out to a person and then you ask him whether he learned it later. But I remember one time, oh, this was, uh, some time ago, uh, when I was, I was going to school, as a matter of fact, university, and the, there was a local, uh, TV and radio station that had, like, what does the average man know show? Where I went out and I asked people not to, uh, you know, just what do they know? So, the question that I asked them was, alright, all of you know, uh, you've heard the term, the Axis powers. World War II, there were two groups battling each other. They were called the, the Allies and the Axis powers. 
Do you know that I asked three people in a row, and of the three, not one of the three, and these were all people who were, say, like in their 40s, could tell me whether we were in the Axis or the Allies. Now, I'll tell you what, one of the funniest ones. This woman, who, by the way, was an intelligent woman, she seemed to be very intelligent. She was there. She had the, uh, you know, look very intelligent, talk very intelligent. I said, Madam, I said, okay. Now, the Axis powers, we know, were headed by Germany. One of their partners was a country that had as its flag the rising sun. And another country that they had that was in it was <laughs> was shaped like a boot. <laughs> I said, now, can you tell me those two countries? There was a long pause, and she says, oh, yes, yes, uh, the Philippines. It's a rising sun. I said, all right, madam. I just went right on. She says, all right, madam, you've got one clear of the question now. You've, uh, the, the Philippines have this flag as the rising sun. Now, what country was the last one that shaped like a boot? She says, oh, a country shaped like a boot. I said, I'll give you a clue. They had a dictator named Il Duce. Oh, uh, Il Duce, uh, Il Duce, uh, um, uh, Il Duce, uh, Oh, I, I've got it. I said, yes. I figured, you know, at last we're getting the truth. She says, uh, uh, Japan. I says, you're correct. It's shaped like a booth. And they had a dictator named Il Duce. You know. At the, she was very pleased. <laughs> and the crowd applauded. <laughs> now, she wasn't being funny. I'm telling you that 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 if you were to stop out of a out of a thousand people walking down the street and ask them what Martin Luther King was, what was he? What was he? Some I'm, I'm sure a, a significant per percentage would say, well, wasn't he some kind of a singer? Um, and no, no, I tell you, he's a politician. And uh, what he actually was, what he said, just did you know the name? You know. Do you know that 26 percent of the people that were questioned recently in uh, in Philadelphia did not know what significant event occurred in 1776? George Aid, you were ahead of your time. <laughs> hey, Ma, watch Pearl Harbor. Well, she's on that hillbilly program, uh, 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 the Grand Ole Opry. This is WOR New York. Stay tuned for In Conversation.